So today is our one and only lecture in chapter 6. There's an introduction to heat transfer, and we want to get to, let's say, uh, external flows and natural convection and heat exchangers and thermal radiation. And so I've struggled with what to do with chapter 6. And the best I can do is, is give one lecture. So we have flow over flat plate. This flat plate is knife edged. But when we talk about knife edged, we're having something that's very sharp. So it splits the oncoming flow perfectly. And if you had a blunt edge, what would happen? Well, this fluid packet would need to go to the top. Maybe this one would go around to the bottom. And when it would come around, what would it do? You would get this, this uh, separation region in here. And uh, when you have blunt edges, you're going to get that separation because some of the flow is, has to kind of get around, and then it's pushing up as it comes around this lip. It's not just going straight. We're only interested in flat plates, okay? Flat that is aligned with the flow. So if you have a knife edge flat plate that looks like this and the flow is coming at it like this, well, our equations, we're not solving that problem. Uh, nor are we solving a problem where the surface is curved like a wing and it's separating and going like that and it's flowing over. You can generalize it in fluid mechanics. You did generalize it. In heat transfer with the correlations, we did generalize it. But this is sort of the starting point. We're looking at a knife edge flow over a flat plate that's aligned with the, with the, 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 the direction of the flow coming at it. And so all of this has the beginning of the knife edge and so we'll start a coordinate system right here. And that coordinate system is x. And it starts at 0. And what's that called? x at 0 is equal to the leading edge. And then somewhere the plate ends. We'll say that's L. And that's the trailing edge. OK, so our knife edge flat plate that's aligned with the flow goes from 0 to L. So what is x? x goes between 0 and L. And then we have the other coordinate direction, y. y goes up. And uh, so what we have is our velocity coming in. And it's uniform. It's u infinity. It's constant velocity profile just coming in. It's very easy. First, you know, we're starting into the, the complexities of convection. Let's start easy. And so what about this y? Where does y start? What's the lowest value of y? Well, that's at the surface, isn't it? Isn't that where the surface is? And what does it go to? Does it end? Does it, it? No, it goes off to infinity. There's no y doesn't go between 0 and L. It goes 0 to infinity. All right. Now, we're interested in the velocity field. We'll use this. V is equal to ui plus lowercase vj. It's two-dimensional, and this makes sense to us. So this is a, a vector velocity field, and we have both components, u and v. u is the velocity component in the x direction, and lowercase v is in the y direction. And so in general, u could be a, a, a function of both the location x and the location y in that flow field above that knife-edged, aligned, flat plate. Likewise, V could be a function of location in that flow field. And then we start getting students confused. <laughs> because what exactly is U? What exactly is V? What exactly is U a function of? Is it a function of primarily of X, primarily of Y? Is V a function? And so, so try to get the coordinates. X is aligned with the the plate, and y is perpendicular to the plate. OK, now right here, at y equal to 0, anywhere, at any x, guess what the velocity is? 0. zero. So the velocity is equal to the plate velocity, uh, which for this case is 0. It's not, I'm going to have a stationary plate. <coughs> It's a no-slip boundary condition, right? Isn't that what we call that? No-slip. 
If you want to make the problem more complicated, you can have the plate moving, but let's just start off easy. So no slip boundary condition. All right. Now, as the flow hits this plate, what's going to happen to, let's say, I want to plot the velocity profile at this location. So let me redraw this and get this out of the way. Okay. What a, so what I'm doing is I moved the Y coordinate system down here, haven't I? And I moved it to this X location that's somewhere between zero and L. And I want to sketch the velocity profile. All right. What does that velocity profile look like? It has to start at zero. And then way out here, it's all U infinity, isn't it? And then what happens in here? And what do we call that zone right in here? We call this the BL, the boundary layer. That's where the presence of the flat plate has been felt into the fluid. And if you're closer to the leading edge, that thickness of the boundary layer is small. And as you go out further down the, the length of the plate, the presence of the, the effect of the um, plate is felt further into the fluid, so the boundary layer grows. OK. Let me, you ready for a clicker question? Oh, all of my questions are easy, Hector. <laughs> all of them. So for flow over the knife-edged flat plate, which statement is correct about the location x? Does x go between 0 and l, 0 and infinity, negative infinity and l, negative infinity and positive infinity? Well, let's take a look at our results. So, yeah, x is aligned with the axis of the flat plate. Starts at 0. Where, what is 0 called? The leading or trailing edge? Leading edge, yeah, and the trailing edge like that. So there you go. Let's not do clicker on this one. You just tell me what's the answer. What about y? Y goes between what and what? Zero and infinity. That's right. It goes off to infinity. Okay. So we have that velocity boundary layer concept. So I'll try and redraw. Here's our knife edge flat plate. Here is uh, the velocity profile at the, the, right at the tip. There's a little singularity right at the tip because you got the flow coming in at u infinity, then all of a sudden it abruptly stops to zero because of the no slip. But I'm just going to say it's all just u infinity. U infinity. But you move a little further down, and the flow is like that. You move a little further down. I draw it wrong there. Like that. And so what we have is we have the growth of the boundary layer. I didn't draw it set well. Sorry about that. Let me try and draw it again. Something like that. Okay. So at this location, x, you say that this is the thickness of the velocity boundary layer. What symbol do we use? This little delta. And uh, sometimes we're going to, because we're interested in heat transfer as well in this class, sometimes we'll put a delta t on it. What do you think that T is for? Temperature, temperature. We're going to get to that in a minute, but right now it's just a velocity. So you think about it, we're interested in, this is U infinity out here, but anywhere in here, isn't U less than U infinity? And doesn't U go to zero at the plate at Y equal to zero? Yeah. And so... Um, what we're plotting is only the one component, the x component of the velocity field. We know there's a little v component, but let's not worry about that. We're just interested in the, the x component. So u at any location x where y is equal to delta, it's defined as being some fraction of u infinity. This is the equation to give us the, the velocity uh, boundary layer thickness. So this fraction always tormented me as a student. It's like, but you can remember that fraction. So what is that fraction that I'm looking for in the box? It's a number. It's a fraction. Zero point something. What is it? Zero point nine nine. 
Why is it not 0 0.98? Why is it not 0 0.95? 0 0.95 makes more sense to me, but guess what? All the literature I've seen is 0.99. I'm kind of glad that there's consensus on it, but I never really had it explained why it's 0.99 to my satisfaction. So I'm not going to attempt to say why it's 0.99 and not 0.98 or 0.975 or whatever. We're talking about the point in like exactly where y is equal to delta x. Where at this location, the velocity is 99% of the free stream. That's right. This is the equation that gives us the thickness criteria. Essentially, you can't see the difference in a plot. Typically, it's like so small that it's, it's reached its U infinity as you go out. All right. But let's not get bogged down of why historically it's 99%. Let's move on and just say, great, there's consensus that it's 99%. Uh, but we're really interested in what's happening down here at the surface. So at the surface, you could see that we have... Uh, the law of viscosity is going to apply everywhere in the fluid, but especially the law of viscosity is going to apply at the surface. So the law of viscosity is something like tau, the shear stress is mu, du, dy, and I'm only interested in the shear stress uh, on this plate, plane like this. So we have the fluid on top a little faster, the fluid on bottom a little slower, and you have this viscous shear stress going on. Okay, so we apply it at y equal to zero or x equal to zero. I can't remember. At the surface, is that x equal to zero or y equal to zero? y equal to zero, exactly. All right, but sometimes it'll put by mistake, I'll put x equal to zero, and I really, you know, it's y equal to zero. And then this gets a little subscript s. Why is there now a subscript on that tau? Because it's the surface shear stress. It's, it's at the surface of the wall or the plate. Okay, so this is our law of viscosity. So we got the boundary layer thickness concept, and we'll later we'll get the thermal boundary layer thickness concept and the shear stress at the wall. Now, uh, if we tried to plot the shear stress going as a function of x, right? The shear stress at the wall as a function of x, a lot of times I'll emphasize, hey, now I'm talking about not as the average over the whole entire thing, but at the location x. Do you think it uh, is pretty flat? Do you think it increases? Do you think it decreases? What's, what's going on with that shear stress at the wall? What does it look like? as a function of x. Should I pause and walk around and let you sketch on your paper what that looks like? It's classic plot out of fluid mechanics. Right? So I'm trying to line it up. Maybe this is L from x equal to 0 to L. What's it doing? Only do laminar. Don't, don't throw half of the plate, then goes turbulent. Don't do that. Just laminar flow over the entire length, zero to L. So there's a little singularity right here where the flow at the, at the leading edge abruptly comes to zero. The only thing that's going to abruptly come to zero is like if it's got infinite viscosity in the fluid at the tip or infinite rate of change of u with respect to y. So it goes off to infinity. And it's never going to go negative, nor is it going to go to zero, but it's going to go to some value low, something like that. So any plot like that I would accept. And it continues to drop off. It doesn't go flat. It's, it's dropping off. But it's slower, and sl at the rate of dropping off is slower and slower. Okay, let's press forward. So why does it go slower and slower, though? Like well, you can get an analytic expression for tau s as a function of x from your fluids book, and may even be in here. I can't remember if we repeated that part of fluid mechanics in here. I'm sorry, I just don't recall. Oh, okay. All right, no worries. So here's a another clicker question. So the boundary layer thickness is a function of either x, y, both x and y, or neither x or y. 
the boundary layer thickness. Is it a function of x? The boundary layer thickness a function of y? The boundary layer thickness a function of x and y? Or the boundary layer is a function of none of those? Did everybody get in? I hope they did. Let's take a look. Well, hmm. So let's uh, sketch over here. This is our knife edge flat plate. X is going from 0 off to L, all right? And uh, we're interested in, at this location, X, we're interested in the thickness of the boundary layer, delta. And delta is a measure of how far, Y, you know, how far do I have to go into, into that perpendicular direction, in the Y direction, before I get to 99% of the free stream velocity. That was the equation, right? Okay, so, hmm. So, um, what do you think? Um, the boundary layer thickness is a function of the location because as I go down further, the boundary layer thickness, it's if I plotted the boundary layer thickness, it would start at zero and then it would be, that's what we're really plotting. The height of this is the boundary layer thickness. Isn't it a function of x? Yeah, it's a function of x. Hmm. Well, I said this was a tough lecture. All right, let's press forward. Oh, do I want to answer these or not? In the velocity boundary layer, that's what we're talking about, we are primarily interested in solving for u as a function of x, u as a function of y, v as a function of x, or v as a function of y. All right, well, this is a, one of those where, again, in your mind, you kind of quickly resketch. And so as x goes that way, what's happening is we're often sketching the velocity, saying, oh, there's dramatic effect, and then out here, it's all the velocity is just u infinity everywhere outside the boundary layer. And uh, what did we just sketch there? Didn't we sketch u as a function of y? Isn't that what we just sketched? That's what we repeatedly sketch. We sketch u as a function of y at different locations in this type of introduction to fluid flow. So the best answer was not u as a function of x. u as a function of y. u as a function of y, correct? Isn't it? Very good. All right. Now, the velocity boundary layer thickness is a function of, this is a repeat of the other question. Should we do it just to see if we're awake or not? Yes, yes. Please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we got only one, one holdout. So the velocity boundary layer thickness is a measure of how far in the y direction the effects of viscosity are felt. But it's a function of where you are from the leading to the trailing edge. It's a function of x. But now we're going to talk a little bit about local and average values because sometimes, again, you'll see this, this over bar. So for the wall shear stress, we put a tau s comma x for local if we really want to emphasize, hey, this is at the location x. Okay, and then they'll put tau s average, or they'll put tau, the tau at the surface average comma L. What does that mean? This means average from the leading to the trailing edge, averaged over the entire length L. So the equation for this, that the, the average of the shear stress is 1 over the length, the integral from 0 to L, uh, this is the equation for that one, of tau sx dx, isn't it? Isn't that how you get the average? You say, sum up all the values, you know, as you multiply by little steps dx, that's the summation part, the integration, then to divide by the total length, and there you go, that's the average value. Okay, now the skin, sometimes they leave off skin, they'll just call it the friction coefficient, c sub f. 
I like to say skin, but you don't need to say skin. You can just say the friction coefficient. If it's local, sometimes they'll emphasize with the subscript X. That's why, where are you at? Are you close to the leading edge? If you're close to the leading edge, it's very high. If you're further down toward the trailing edge, it's dropping off and it's never going to zero, but it's getting smaller and smaller. Likewise, you could have uh, the C sub F over the length L averaged. Oh, that's just what over the length, the integral from zero to L of C sub F X, the local DX. Those are all in your equations uh, in your fluid mechanics textbooks. But we need to review the fluids so that when we add the complexity of the heat transfer, we have something to build on. So here's just a clean graphic. I could have started here. Sometimes when I lecture, I do start here. But uh, here is the velocity profile, U infinity coming in. Try to make it a nice knife edged, sharp edged corner, you know, flat plate aligned with the direction of the flow, the growth of that boundary layer. And so in here, U is a function of Y, isn't it? The velocity at that location X is a function of location Y. But out here, U is not a function of Y. It's a constant. It's infinity, U infinity, or the free stream velocity. Now, uh, so we have this free stream velocity, this boundary layer thickness, and it's a function of X as you're going further down. It's getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. We have that wall shear stress, the shear stress at the wall, y equal to zero, and then the dimensionless coefficient of friction because what are the SI units on the wall shear stress? SI units, would they be newtons? Newton per meter, Newton per meter squared, Newton per meter cubed, answer A, B, C, or D. SI units for the wall shear stress. Newtons, newtons per meter, newtons per meter squared, or newtons per meter cubed. And so a lot of you had that correct. It's force per unit area. It's a shear stress, stress. Okay, um, that was good. Now, what are the SI units for the, the uh, coefficient of friction? Coefficient of friction is the shear stress divided by one half rho u infinity squared. Okay, what's the name? No clicker question here, but what's the name of one half rho u infinity squared? Dynamic pressure, dynamic, you know, velocity pressure, something like that. One half rho u infinity squared. It's the concept in the pitot tube, Bernoulli's equation, things like that. So that's a good review of fluid mechanics, but this has the same units of uh, newtons per meter squared, pressure, wall shear stress, newtons per meter squared. So guess what the total SI unit for the skin friction coefficient? Dimensionless, one. Yeah, dimensionless, no SI unit. So it's a, it's a dimensionless tau. Hey, here's a clicker question. Look at those equations and say, what is the wall shear stress defined as? A, B, C, D, or E? It's so good. There's a lot of us that have it. It's this one. Mu is mu times du dy at y equal to zero. Isn't y equal to zero at the surface? Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's move on. Now that we've mastered the velocity, and the velocity profile, and then the growth of the velocity boundary layer, and then the wall shear stress and the friction coefficient, guess what we can do? We can now talk about temperature. So we have this plate, and this plate knife edged, and let's say it's hot. And the fluid coming in is all uniform temperature, and it has T infinity, and it's cool, cold. So we'll pick a location, x, let's say this is the location of interest right here, this x, and we'll plot as a function of y going from zero to infinity, the temperature, the temperature as I march out further and further. Well, way out here, it'll be cold, so it'll all have t infinity, right? Just like we did the velocity, it'll all be t infinity. But then down here, it'll be a longer length right here indicating that the surface temperature, Ts, is high, 
And then what do we have right in here? Some transition. <laughs> Some transition of the temperature where the presence of the hot plate has been sending you know, heat out and warming the fluid as the fluid's flowing over it. So if you go down further, uh, or if I get closer to the leading edge, it's a sharper transition, isn't it? And as I go further away from the leading edge, get toward the trailing edge, T infinity is the same, try to draw that the same. TS is the same, try and draw that the same. But the transition defect has been felt further into the fluid. And so we have the growth of a thermal boundary layer. That's exactly right, the thermal boundary layer. So in this case, the temperature is truly a function of location. But primarily what we do is we go to a location X, go to this you know, downstream location, and then plot it as a function of Y, where this is, that at, this, at this X location, T is a function of Y. All right. So um, let's do this. T at Y goes off to infinity is equal to T infinity. T at Y equal to zero is equal to TS, the surface temperature. So a lot of times I say, well, this plotting a temperature is great, but I've been, had this theta where it's the temperature minus the surface temperature divided by the T infinity minus the surface temperature. We've seen these thetas before, Temp the ratio of temperature differences. So do this, what is theta at Y equal to, what do you, you want to do? We've got to do both of them, goes off to infinity, and theta at Y equal to zero. So this is, this is deep into the fluid. What is theta? Deep into the fluid, far away from the plate. Y goes off to infinity. What is that? Just look at the equation. What is it? One. All right. And then what is uh, theta at the plate at Y equal to zero? Zero, so it goes as zero to one. It's it's just like plotting in velocity. We if we would have plotted uh, u asterisk, which is um, uh, u dove over u infinity. So what does u asterisk do as y goes off to infinity? And then what does u asterisk do as y goes is equal to zero? Zero and one. Yeah, isn't it? So it's like, oh, look at that. We we're able to, to cast in dimensionless terms. The velocity profile goes 0 to 1. Likewise, this temperature difference ratio, uh, temperature profile, go from 0 at the surface to 1. And you can see the, the building the analogy this way. OK. So uh, very much there's a thermal no slip. That's why it's the, um, the same value, the surface temperature. Oh, let's see, did I cover everything? How about this one? What is theta at a particular location x from the leading to the, toward the trailing edge at y equal to delta t is equal to what fraction do you think they picked? How far out do you have to go before it's essentially out to 1? 0 0.99, same type of criteria. 99%. Okay. So that gives us the definition for how big is my thermal boundary layer. Okay. So here's a summary slide, just like we had before. Here's a plot of the temperature. Here's a plot of uh, temperature difference ratio in terms of theta. So theta is 1, far away in the free stream. And then you have this boundary layer, delta t. Uh, sometimes I write it with a cap t. Sometimes I write it with lowercase t. It's just theta with the t, OK? Um, and then what we're really interested in is getting the heat into, into the fluid. Well, if it's going to get into the fluid, I can focus on right here. Right here, there's a stagnant layer of fluid. 
And the only way it moves through that stagnant layer of fluid is described by this equation. What is that equation again? Fourier's law. It describes the conduction. So we have the heat flux, Q double prime, moving from the surface into the fluid, is equal to minus K subscript F. What is the subscript F on that K doing? Emphasizing it's not the K of the plate. It's the K of the fluid, the thermal conductivity of the fluid, because a lot of people will make a mistake, and they'll think, oh, I need to know if it's copper, or aluminum, or steel, or some stainless steel, or something of the plate. Nope. This is, and it, if you put a little plus on that, it's into the fluid. It's the rate of change of temperature with respect to Y just into the fluid off the plate. So if you had a mathematician, you'd say Y is equal to zero plus a little or some notation like that. I remember it from calculus. But in this book, they just leave it off and say, hey, it's at the plate, the temperature derivative in the fluid. Well, what is this equation? This was Fourier's law. What's this equation? Law of cooling. And so what I can do is I can equate these equations and get rid of the Q double prime, and I get an equation for H, that's what I really want, an equation to allow me to predict H from first principles. It's just like we we're getting the friction coefficient and shear stress at the wall from first principles. You can get the convection coefficient and look at it. It's the thermal conductivity of the fluid, the rate of change of temperature at the wall in the fluid, and then divided by that temperature difference. It's kind of abstract, but this is the beginning of how to get H from first principles. So we have the idea of the local H. Maybe you put a subscript X on it. Maybe you just leave it off. And then you get the average H. If I put an L on here, that would emphasize it's averaged over the length from 0 to L. Sometimes you'll put H bar X. Well, that means it's kind of crazy. It's just for the 0 to X average. So you have to divide by X there. Um, H of x dx, but this is this is more common. Average from zero to to um, l. Okay, and so you, if you wanted to introduce that temp dimensionless temperature difference, uh, then you find that it gets rid of the negative sign. It, it has a thermal conductivity of the fluid, and then you just have this derivative of the dimensionless temperature profile. OK. And then one last step, if you wanted to, um, you could say, uh, well, I don't know if I want to beat you up with that. But at this point, you have the local Nusselt number. What's that? HX, I'm going to put L divided by K. Well, I already have the equation for HX. What is that? It's K of the fluid. Isn't this K of the fluid that you're dividing by? Yeah, so they both cancel, but let's not cancel it right away. The derivative of theta with respect to Y at the surface times L. So the K's cancel, and what we find is that the Nusselt number at the location is the dimensionless temperature difference ratio divided by, and I'm going to put Y asterisk right there at the surface. And Y asterisk is simply Y divided by L. It's a dimensionless distance. It's Y divided by L. And so some people will talk very abstractly. Oh, the new salt number is a, is a dimensionless gradient at the surface. Gradient of what? The temperature gradient at the surface. Very abstract, isn't it? Okay, let's press on. Wow, there is a lot. I just put it in a table to help you get a roadmap. You could talk about a local value at the location x. The local at the location x is equal to L. What's happening at the trailing edge? You could talk about the average from 0 to x as well as the average from 0 to L. These are the big one. This big one right there. Okay. But they try to 
have notation, but every now and then the notation can get a little confusing. You have to dig a little. Exactly what am I doing? So here you can see the different notation. H at L without an overbar. If it has an overbar, it's an average over the whole plate from leading to trailing edge. And this is an average over 0 to X. You can do the same thing for the wall shear stress, the friction coefficient. The Reynolds number doesn't have some sort of averaging like that. It's just look at the Reynolds number at this location or at the trailing edge, that location at the end of the plate. And here's for the Neusselt number. All right. We can solve this problem. So we have air at a given temperature and a given velocity flows over a knife edge flat plate and the plate is cold, it's at a lower temperature. The temperature distribution in the boundary layer is given by this analytic expression. Why do they do that? Well, not because it's true, but simply because you can now analytically differentiate it if you need to get the derivative of that, that the distribution. And they'll notice they put it in terms of theta, didn't they? Isn't this temperature in terms, you know, T minus TS divided by T infinity minus TS, isn't that theta? Sure. They give us a thermal conductivity, Prandtl number, and this viscosity, this kinematic viscosity. And so they say, what is the surface heat flux? And this is the answer, but how did you get the surface heat flux? What's the equation to get the surface heat flux? Q double prime at the surface. How do we calculate that? Uh, minus K dt dy at y equal to zero, right? And so you could take this equation and express T is equal to Ts plus T infinity minus Ts times 1 minus the exponential, I'll write it like that, of the minus the Prandtl number times u infinity y divided by nu. And then you say, okay, now I need to get the derivative of t with respect to y. This is challenging your calculus you know, skills. And so the derivative of t with respect to y comes in at t infinity minus ts with the minus exp. Well, let me do this. A minus a minus, which is now a plus, a minus a minus, which is a plus, the Prandtl number, u infinity over nu, times exp minus Prandtl number u infinity y over nu. Did I do that correctly? Yeah. And now we evaluate this, dt dy at y equal to zero. So we're left with the t infinity minus ts. This, uh, we're left with the Prandtl u infinity over nu. Exponential, when I put in that y equal to zero, it's exp of zero. Exp of zero is one. Exponential of zero is one. So this just goes to uh, one. And then you plug in here and you use the value of k, et cetera. And you get this answer that q double prime s is negative 3,660 watts per meter squared. What do they mean by the negative sign? Well, it's not from the hot plate into the cold fluid. It's the, just the opposite, right? Because what's hot? The fluid's hot. <laughs> so it's in the negative y direction. It's into the cold plate. So the, the signs will work themselves out. Now, what's the convection coefficient h? How do we find that? Well, our basic equation is, is that um, the flux is equal to H times what dr drives the temperature, uh, the temperature difference, which was T S minus T infinity. So um, I hate to say it, but it's that simple. Q double prime, what we just solved for, uh, T S minus T infinity. You put those in and H comes in at uh, 61 watts per meter squared degree C.
All right. So document toy I felt like in heat transfer things flow always from hot to cold. Why is this case like Bec uh, the fluid out here is hot and the plate is cold. And so the flow is not in the positive y direction, but the flow of heat is in the negative y direction. Q double prime is in the negative. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Thank you. Yep. So a quick review of laminar flow versus turbulent flow. I know that this really is not essential for this chapter. Uh, maybe I should skip it if it's not essential. But laminar, the fluid packet, as you flow in, into the layer, it stays in the same lamina or layer. But then once it gets typically far enough down the plate, you get to a critical location where the Reynolds number at X critical is a value that people have agreed upon, like, oh, that's where we observe it again and again and again experimentally. Not theoretically derived, but experimentally observed. For flow over flat plate, it's how much money is in my bank account? $500 million. Uh, what? No, 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 no. No, not $500,000. Sorry about that. It's, a, it's not that much money. But it's, it's that number. It's half a million, isn't it? So at this, when the Reynolds number is half a million, and the Reynolds number grows because it's a function of x isn't it rho u infinity x divided by mu so as it continues to as x gets further and further away from the leading edge it grows and grows and grows linearly and if it hits a half a million they say oh it's going to trip now it's going to be turbulent when it's turbulent it grows a little faster but you get a laminar sublayer but the overall turbulent flow is out here and so if, if the fluid packet was kind of in this lamina, it doesn't necessarily stay in that lamina or layer. It bounces around in turbulent flow. It could be down here or it could be over there. And so at any instant in time, the velocity out at that location could be this way, that way, this way, that way, you know, whatever the velocity is. But if you did the time averaged, over you know a, a long enough time at that location it would be the mean velocity still going down the pipe or down the flow over the, the um, flat plate so anyway there you go um, you can take a look at what the shear stress at the wall does there's a little kick up right after it trips laminar uh, same with the, um, the skin friction coefficient wheel Guess what? Um, somehow the equation didn't come across. It got lost in the translation. But if you were given h as a function of x, maybe uh, ax squared plus bx plus c, you should be able to do things like uh, evaluate h at x equal to 3. Uh, get the average uh, over 0 to 3 which is simply 1 over 3, the integral from 0 to 3 of h of x dx. You're integrating. And then likewise, get the average from 0 to 1, and then get the average from 2 to 3. And unfortunately, my equation got lost, so we'll skip this problem. Well, that was a lot of uh, introduction already, a lot of material, but we need to continue in. And you can get boundary layer equations. These are three separate equations. This one probably looks the most familiar to you. This one the second most, and this one's the new one. Um, this is uh, mass. This is momentum. And this is energy. What do you mean mass, momentum, energy? It's a statement of the conservation of mass at a point. It comes from the continuity equation. It's called the continuity equation. It uh, sure doesn't look like the continuity equation. Or does it? Does it look familiar to you? It's 2D, two-dimensional, rectangular. It's steady state. And it's, it's uh, also constant density. The density is a, a constant, so I've taken it out. And there you go. 
What about this equation? Well, we call it the momentum equation. Some people call it the conservation of momentum equation, but it really is an F equal to MA, Newton's second law type of equation. So if there's an imbalance of things that want to accelerate it, it'll accelerate. Or if there's an imbalance of things that want to decelerate it, it'll decelerate. So what is this? This is maybe how the pressure is pushing on it to push it forward or slow it down. What is this term right here? Uh, viscous effects. So if I have a layer that's fast near a layer that's slow, well, there's, there's going to be a shear stress. The fast is going to be retarded and the slow is going to be accelerated. And then this is my advection of mo momentum. And then energy. How does energy transfer? Well, this one is just the diffusion of energy, just like the diffusion of momentum. So you have conductivity and so I have something hot near something cold and the hot's going to transfer heat away from it the cold's going to receive some heat transfer to it so that's what's happening just like for the momentum this term is almost always thrown out but it's in the book that I show it here it's a viscous dissipation term so in our energy balance which is really our internal energy balance it sort of shows up because it's coming from the mechanical component of the energy our heat transfer equation is only the internal energy. It's, it excludes kinetic and potential energy. It's just heat, internal energy. So when you have viscous dissipation, it shows up in our energy balance as something new. And there it is. And then this is advection of uh, heat, um, the internal energy. There's a table in the textbook that's worth looking at. It's a very long table. I've just grabbed three lines out of the table, but it's table 6.2, and it's basically dimensionless groups. It talks about the Reynolds number. You're familiar with the Reynolds number coming out of fluids. The coefficient of friction, you're familiar with that one coming out of fluids. So what does it look like in the definition, and then some interpretation, ratio of inertial to viscous, and the dimensionless shear stress. This is the new one, the Nusselt number. I mentioned it already in the lecture today, but before this lecture, I don't think we really were introduced to it. H, some L, put that over here, and then K, K of the fluid, thermal conductivity. It's a ratio of the convection, the pure conduction heat transfer, if you like that definition. There's, you could put it to the dimensionless temperature gradient at the surface. That true is also true. Well, this is a little challenging. But we take our momentum equation and we want to turn it into a dimensionless momentum equation. So we introduce U asterisk. What's that? Dimensionless location. So uh, not location, dimensionless speed. So it's U over U infinity, just like V asterisk is V over U infinity. So we normalize by the free stream velocity. We do the same thing for location. X over L is X asterisk asterisk and y over l is dimensionless location for pressure you just have p infinity and then you divide it by rho u infinity it's like instead of the half there you could put the half in or leave the half out this book leaves the half out okay so you take this term right here this u and you just say u over u infinity but i need to bring a u infinity out here to make it balance and then u, I have right there, so I divide by u infinity. I bring another u infinity, so I have u infinity squared out there. Likewise, I take the x, I want to divide by l, but I can't do that for free. I have to divide by l out here, but now it's balanced. I have l times 1 over l. And so then I have this group of terms. Do the same thing with this one. They both have u infinity squared over l on the outside, and you've just turned that into dimensionless advection of the momentum. Do the same thing for the pressure. You get P asterisk over X asterisk. Same thing for the velocity. Um, and uh, then you can cancel what I've shown in red. And then you bring terms across and you get this funny grouping right there. You stare at it a while and you say, oh, it's the upside down Reynolds number. It's one over the Reynolds number. And so you turn this equation into a dimensionless equation, the same momentum equation, but it's in terms of dimensionless length and dimensionless velocity and dimensionless pressure. And it has a property in it, one over the Reynolds number. That's where it shows up. 
You can do the same thing with the thermal. I didn't spend the time. I even just blitzkrieged right through the velocity, didn't I? <laughs> Went real fast, 1 over Reynolds number. And you'll get 1 over Reynolds number, Prandtl number. What happened to that viscous dissipation term? Threw it out, make legible. We then take a look at our boundary conditions for the flow over that flat plate. At the wall, that U asterisk and T asterisk have the same value. And far away, free stream, they're one and one, one and one. And so that you look at these similarity variables, hold it. It's like if these were the same, they have the same boundary conditions, then we'd get the same profile, the same solution. And what's interesting that we want in the profile is that dimensionless temperature at the surface, and that's related to the Nusselt number, and then the dimensionless velocity at the surface, that's related to the skin friction coefficient. So the skin friction coefficient is this dimensionless velocity at the surface times 2 over Reynolds number. Dimensionless, or Nusselt number is dimensionless temperature. Well, these are the same. The dimensionless terms are the same. So what you see is if I took this Reynolds number over 2, then the, that is equal to the Nusselt number. I know I'm going fast. But that is the original Reynolds analogy. Who came up with it? Osborne Reynolds. He published it. Other people looked at it said, wow, that's interesting. Uh, that the Nusselt number for a set of conditions, it's like flow over a knife edge flat plate, is equal to C sub F over 2 times the Reynolds number. They experimentally checked it a bunch of times, used different fluids with different Prandtl numbers, and they said, look, it's a little better if we put this modification in there. It's not from the theory, it's from the experimental observation. And so that's called the modified Reynolds analogy. And so most people, this is the Reynolds analogy, or the modified Reynolds analogy. That last component is for experimental observations. But this first part is just truly by observation or analogy in the mathematics. What you can do with this is solve a problem like this. What do we have? We have that the, the Nusselt number is equal to the C sub F divided by 2 Reynolds Prandtl to the 1 third. Let me back up here. So you can do this, you can unravel in here is our shear stress. That's our, and that's related to our drag force. Here, that's our convection coefficient, which is related to our rate of heat transfer. <laughs> and so you can make some drag force measurements, ravel it up, use the analogy, unravel, and predict heat transfer. And that type of problem is what they do is use this analogy. So anyway, here we have air. It has a velocity of U infinity of 15 meters per second, a free stream temperature of 15 degrees C. It hits a flat plate where the surface temperature is given down here 140 degrees C. And uh, the only thing they really tell us is the air induces a drag force on this flat plate. Maybe I'll put it down here, point 0.062 newtons. That's a drag force that the, the, the flat plate feels. They give us the area of the flat plate. Area is 0 0.25 meters squared. And uh, knowing that information, what is the electric power required to maintain the surface temperature at that high surface temperature, 140? And so what is uh, basically Q, uh, at Q the, the rate of heat transfer? That's what you're asked to solve for. What is Q? Okay, it's going to come in at 660. Where does it come from? Electric resistive heating. Okay. So what you do with this one is you get the shear stress, which is the drag force divided by the area. That's not too hard. The drag force divided by the area gives me 0 0.248 newtons per meter squared. I can then get the C sub F. C sub F is the shear stress divided by 1 half rho U infinity squared. So we calculate 0 0.00222.
So it's like, check, I'm moving that direction. And then what is my Reynolds number? My Reynolds number is rho u infinity L divided by mu. At this point, I have to go get properties of air. And so the thing that you do is you say, look, at, is, should I get the property of air at 15C or 140C or some average? Get the property of air at what they call the film temperature, which is T infinity plus T surface divided by 2, just the average. It's that simple. And I picked these values such that this is 350 Kelvin, which means no interpolation in the table, in the air properties table. So when you get the air properties at 350 Kelvin, I'll let you get rho and mu and nu and k and alpha and Prandtl number. All those are listed at 350 Kelvin. Then what you can do is you can get this Reynolds number. Now, they do say it's a square plate. They give you the total area. That area is equal to L squared, so you're able to get L as a square root of area. So you have to get the length. Because the flow comes in and goes over the plate. You need that length in the Reynolds number. Anyway, the Reynolds number comes in at 358,509. It's like, done. Prandtl number is a property. I can use this analogy. I get the Neusselt number kind of walking down this way. The Neusselt number comes in at 352.6. The Neusselt number, I unravel it because the Neusselt number is defined as H, L divided by K. So H is equal to the Neusselt times K divided by L. It's like you're either raveling things into dimensionless parameters or unraveling the dimensionless parameters to get what you want. And then you calculate the H to be a 21.16 watts per meter squared degree C. And then Q is my H times A times delta T. And we just did the hard part of getting H. And so this comes in at 661 watts. So hopefully that made sense. So what The properties are in Appendix A, Table table A.4 for the properties of air. Now, on an exam, if you, I don't give you the book. I don't give you all the tables. If uh, a problem needs it, I'll either give you the property values or I'll give you the table and then let you look them up. No memorization of property values. That would be way, that would be ridiculous. Okay, so in summary, we went a long way. A lot of it was review of fluids, but uh, sometimes we have to be reminded of what we learned in previous classes, but we get down here to this equation. This equation does not work, do not apply if you have a large wake region. No. It's, it's like when you started learning about drag forces on objects. You had the drag force made up of the viscous component and the other component. They have different names of it, but it's like um, form drag. It, it was associated with the pressure component. So if I had a sphere, it's really this wake region creates a low pressure region, and this is a high pressure region, right? If it was Stokes flow around the sphere, you have the full pressure recovery, and the pressure here is the same as the pressure here. That's very slow flow around the sphere. It works then, but it doesn't work when you have separation, when you have wakes. So right away, this does not work when you have a lot of separation. Don't use it. People will still use it, but they're, they're doing it in error, or you know, they're getting a lot further away from it. But especially when you get something that's a lot of separation, a large awake region, don't use it. And how will we be able to determine that? Well, think about this. I have flow inside of a pipe. If I have just flow inside of a straight pipe, is there a wake region? No. Use it heavily in internal flow. External flows, you almost always have some sort of separation of wake regions. Almost never use it unless you're real careful. You know, and you know that, hey, this still applies. 
But this is one of the big, big results in the foundation of uh, convective heat transfer, this modified Reynolds analogy. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be in my office.